This week on Hermitcraft. Green built this really cool house and I couldn't find a place in the script to fit it. My not so starter base. It's basically my storage room. Welcome to the Hermitcraft recap. My name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is Loy XP, and it's week two of Hermitcraft season nine, which means the hostile mobs have no chance at this point. The Hermits are basically immortal now, thanks to raid farms, enchanting services, and beacons going up all over the place. And they can all fly, some of them have magical inventories, run major corporations, they're basically whatever Marvel superheroes you want to superimpose onto them. Hey, some of them even have capes. But even superheroes need some downtime, which is why this week brings some news of Mumbo taking a break to recharge his mental health. Rendog might also be headed home to visit family soon, so folks may come and go a little in these early days. But we also see the welcome return of Hypnotize to the server, and we're sure the hijinks will continue as the season works wonders while attempting to maintain its secret identity. But that identity may not be super secret for much longer, so let's get into the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Doc M, who has a slime farm now, and Ren's Mushroom Island provides a fabulous place for him to AFK at it. But he reveals the only way he knew where the slime chunks were is because some mathematically minded folks from the community looked at the coords for the patch of bedrock Doc used to break onto the nether roof and reverse engineered the seed from there. Shout out to Cortex for the big brain moves. I didn't know the seed. <laughs> so, like, what? What did I do? How did I screw up and leak the seed? The seed is still under wraps for now, though, and Doc has some other technical projects in the works, building a ghast catching machine for an as yet unspecified purpose. He also gets some business done with Gemini Tay and Impulse, receives some redstone from XB Crafted, and builds another sandstone shop to trade slime blocks out of. The icing on the cake comes when he reveals four extra slots of inventory space while hiding under our noses and in the control options the entire time. Um, just make sure you never tap out one more time, dragging it in there. Just do this click here and yeah. And that trick I will use now to haul all the slime and whatever else we need to haul here to make the shops up and running and uh, yeah. With the Hermits breaching the outer end, that's up to 69 nice 112 extra blocks Joe Hills could be carrying at top gun speed if Zombie Cleo does indeed share him some shelker boxes along with the gift of Elytra. I've got you. Ooh, Ooh. these are looking good. There Look at me! Go. Zoom, zoom, zoom! zoom. I went like 12 blocks! Like wow. a whole 12 blocks! Still in the giving mood, Cleo stops by B00 and shares a couple of shulkers with him, even if the guy is afraid of snakes, and therefore of Cleo's hair. Though you could see why she would want to visit a fellow obelisk builder. Cleo's own build starts taking shape, and as promised, it is the ruins of an overgrown ancient temple, which I think means she's tax exempt. But I don't, I don't know. I really like it. It's a nice little ruin. It, it, it feels very me. Having built a starter house out of uh, temporary materials in week one, Joe Hills resolves to remodel his house using something that isn't cubic meters of dirt. As long as I got this shovel. I can keep gathering clay- oh no wait, I'm out of inventory space. And it's going in a spooky direction, given the build is based on a haunted house feature from one of his favourite IRL pinball games. Joe crowdsources ideas for the build palette from his neighbours and anyone else who'll stop by, replacing elements of the house until it's a bit more corporeal. Which is more than we can say for the master of the house, who both dies once and cheats death another time in this episode alone. Oh, come on, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it! There it is, post-mortal, perfect landing. How am I gonna get back down? Oh, is that, oh yeah, that's right, I have an elytra. Perhaps the spookiest thing is that he started displaying his Wordle results in the basement. Now, a starter home is to be expected of Hypnotized as well. This week, Hypno joins the new season and does his best to catch up to his server mates. The starter materials do well for him, and soon enough, he is living out of a way more house-shaped home than most of the player list, frankly. We got a roof, we got like the edge of the roof, more window boxes, more fence posts, yeah, lots of things going on here. Take Stress Monster, for example. Having lived in a teapot for a week, she decides an acorn would be a better property investment. I wonder if I can see it this far away. Oh, I can! I think I need to remove that tree. But first, she has to go to the nether for blaze rods, formalize her trading hall by moving the villagers into booths, then convert some of them into clerics she can buy bottles of enchanting from. Because the nearby teacups are now an enchantee shop, unless you're French, in which case it's pronounced enchanté. Hopefully we will now become rich. 
Uh, maybe not, but we're gonna try. While her cup runneth over, give or take the experiments with glass, she decides it's only polite to provide sugar cubes to her guests as well. They might be a little crunchy. But once the business is established, Stress moves out to the countryside, picking a dark oak forest with an outstanding view of the nearby mountains, and building a giant acorn to fit in with the loosely Alice in Wonderland inspired tea set. She also collabs with False Symmetry on a bridge, allowing for foot traffic from anyone who hasn't got their wings quite yet, which will be useful since False's eagle isn't flying anywhere with its tail missing. <gasps> How did I forget his tail? How did I forget his tail? No one told me! The eagle has no tail! He lost his tail in flight. He lost his tail, we'll have to rebuild it. It's a shame given how useful flying is going to be with how high up False builds her mob farm. The combination tech makes the dark box output enough copper for her to establish a shop to compete with Tango Tech's own business. So the combat for the customers is going to get heated not just in the food industry of the server, which is good, you need heat to work metal, generally. On second thoughts, it helps to heat food, too. While Iskel and Randog use surprisingly little smelting for their respective golden carrots and pumpkin pie recipes, iJevin goes for the hottest heat there is and dips to the nether to build a hoglin farm. Holy crap. Um, best farm ever. That was with four levels, guys. The result is enough pork to feed a server, but only if you can convince it to buy any. Luckily, Jevin has an edge over the competition as the only one with an ad campaign going on. The advertising for his store is spread around on maps, representing an area of the world where Jevin has built a 128 by 128 pixel art with the logo of his shop, inviting passers-by over. Maybe an effort this big will in fact remind the group who's bringing home the bacon. It looks so good, man. Now, if you want to find the artist of this map, please check the link in the description. If it was a map art contest, though, Vintage Beef is literally designing a map art contest. He reveals three cards from the Hermitcraft trading card game, a golden apple, a grass block, and a double grass block card. He's also been revealing card designs for the hermits themselves, but he's rolling them out slowly while asking the audience to help classify what each hermit's category should be. In the last episode, you voted for Cub Fan as a balanced hermit. Yeah, the move, the move names might change and the background behind Cub himself might change. In the meantime, he's still flat broke. And while everyone else is walking around in diamond armor, he barely has enough diamonds to commission a silk touch shovel from Impulse. Yeah, you're, you're making a killing, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just did a thing, you know. <laughs> what the heck? Get the... Luckily, even though he's going to be using a lot of the wool himself, the sheep farm has been running around the clock, and he's got a surplus of colorful fuzz to sell to the other hermits. Setting up a market stall with a stylish banner under the name Three Bags Full, Beef actually has 16 bags full, one for every different colour of wool, and enough left over in the freshly designed stock room that he can provide the goods when people start snapping it all up. Of course, in the meantime, a few golden carrots will still go a long way. Iskal sees other hermits making waves in the food market and decides he'd better think up some other business plans. It doesn't help that Azuma has blocked off his shop with some Alpha Minecraft level building skills. Okay, someone someone seems to have completely just blocked my shop. Do you like my box? <laughs> well. Still, Iskel has had some luck in other areas, finding not one but two other side discs in a dungeon chest, snatching a trident from the hands of a drowned in the spawn lake, and finding the perfect intersection of dripstone and lush biomes to start his epic cave base. Now maybe he can build some more effective homes for the villagers who've been camping it up on his doorstep. I really want to utilize villagers as much as I can this season, but I don't want to keep them here. This is when Cubfan135 enters the mess of snack manufacturers and somehow is the only one to ask the question, how are they going to eat this without some darn sauce? As planned since last week, Cub finally opens his pie-side coffee shop, Cub's Coffee Corner, which is more of a nook, really, but who's counting? Having built several compact auto brewers, Cub departs to gather some coffee ingredients and nearly gets roasted himself. Should be able now to get a bunch more blaze wraps. There we go, we got four from one blaze, nice. Nevertheless, enough recipes see the light of day to fill out a menu. The potion shop is a go and Cub celebrates by having a party in Corrales' garage. XB Crafted has a long-awaited reunion with Corrales, and the two go on a spicy adventure through the nether, the first challenge being to escape the Basalt Delta. Their goal is to raid a bastion, which is a risky business, especially when you dig down right next to a piglin brute. A little bit, anyway. But do you, do you, no, XB, watch out. You, watch out, XB! 
Oh no, I threw my sword in panic. <laughs> at least there's an opportunity for a dance party at the end of it, and after all this excitement, XB decides it's time to settle down in a nice cozy cave around Deep Slate level. This of course means decent access to diamonds, so he has a bit of cash to splash around, but he's not going to neglect his base in the spawn lake either, especially not after Cub has installed a drip leaf parkour path from the mainland. Hop, skip and a jump, and a hop, skip and a jump, and a hop, skip and a jump, and a hop, skip and a jump. Let's go! Ayo! Boo, 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 boo! And XB may not have gotten tired of swimming quite yet, as he raids a distant ocean monument with just a handful of doors and a single water breathing potion. Although he does end up taking away a stack of sponge and the prismarine required for a conduit, so perhaps he's done being waterlogged after all. Some extra smooth moves hit Coralis when Azumavoid moonwalks in on him, hoping to see some crimson or warped stems for sale. Unfortunately, by then, the Coralis Lumbering Company is not quite open just yet. They only got the flannel ready and started installing the sawmill. Somebody's got a new skin. Lumberjack, Coralis, that, that's right. The lumber mill on the shore is Coralis' way of incorporating his home into the landscape, which works surprisingly well for how strikingly brown it is compared to everyone else's terraforming. It is indeed a future wood shop, even if none of the redstone which would help with that is in place. The make pretend machinery is there at least, and really there's still plenty of birch forest to clear out, let's not waste the bone meal just yet. Further recoloration of ground hits Azumavoid's home. As a throwback to the season 2 days when X took out everything but the stone from a desert biome, he starts swapping the grass around his base for stone. Holding out for Coralis to bring in the advanced mushroom blocks, Azuma only expands his home by two rooms as opposed to a dozen. One is to house a kelp farming jar and another for a bee farm, the more to provide him with that good moonwalking honey. The drinking animation doesn't work in the third person. Look at my slow motion walking. Tango Tech gets a different use out of the bumbling bees. With his honey windows already installed and covered up by the furniture, the next best thing is to take advantage of the pollination mechanic the bees provide. It turns out bees flying around can speed up crop growth, so after selecting some especially not allergic villagers, Tango crams them and a few bee nests into a wheat farm and then watches the rates increase. His villager wrangling skills are soon called upon again by Grian and good times with Scar. Four if you need them. I don't know why I walked into a corner to be honest I don't know, you. you were trying to make an exit and then you realized that that was not an exit, so yeah. <laughs> is this an exit? I mean, it is anyway, now. Tango. At first, the two only want to borrow a couple of villagers for rebreeding, but once they spill the beans about wanting to start a shopping empire based on trading, Tango offers to build them a raid farm. Naturally, such a source of free emeralds as well as totems of undying would come in handy for the two, especially the latter now they learned to cause fall damage with a fishing rod. And I would like a chance. Oh! Having volunteered a couple of testificates, Scar proceeds to put elf ears on both of them. The hat technology from last season is back, and it transforms a carved pumpkin into custom models, so that's one less armor slot available to the person with the highest death count. It's why perhaps he needs Cub to escort him through linking up a nether portal, but what a nether portal it is! To fit with his folksy magical theme, Scar builds it as the inner part of an open geode. You could go back to every season, anytime I've needed a link. You've linked it up for me, and I appreciate it. You are my only hope, Cub fan. 135. <laughs> Cheers, dude. Cheers. The home tree also becomes much more whimsical, as the elven architecture makes its way through the branches and onto the roots and the lawn around, back to the copper peaks of the intricate roofs which, wait a minute, where did that copper come from? What's this? <laughs> oh, it did, yeah, I was expanding your, your storage system. It was a surprise. Happy birthday. Uh, okay, you caught me. Despite or because of Scar pinching his hard-earned copper supply, Grian drags him in for a wither boss fight. Luckily for him, Grian remembers to employ a couple of iron golems into the process, and the two come out unscathed and victorious with a quality lamp to show for it. I, I'm actually at a loss that this actually worked. <laughs> I doubted you to be honest. Uneventful. Maybe maybe people don't do this because it's it's not as entertaining. Dude, there's more diamonds. Oh, dude! Business is booming for Impulse SV's enchanting service, but even with a trading hall providing the extra books, he's still in need of more XP levels and emeralds than he can shake a stick at. Enter ENXO4's stacking raid farm, and before we know it, he has nearly 700 levels, which works pretty well, although now when he visits his trading hall again, they shower him with loose paper and stone tools throwing random junk at me. <laughs> like it's, parades and it's stuff? It's garbage beef. It's all garbage <laughs> stuff. This unusual confetti doesn't stop him from expanding their accommodation so he can gather a librarian for every book trade out there and provide the books in exchange for cash over at Iron Chant. 
He also gets to loop Gemini Tay into the ludicrous supply of emeralds he's now sitting on in exchange for a bunch of prismarine from her guardian farm once it's up and running. <laughs> I know. There's, okay, listen, there's a lot of goodies. I'm stealing one. <laughs> okay, go for I it. Because I have a friend who okay. dies a lot, okay? Oh, don't we all? <laughs> and finally, there's Rendog, who, after investing all that time and energy into setting up the business, at least gets to see Gigapies finally turning a profit. His corporate overlords still have something else on the agenda, though, so he has a dispenser pick the direction he'll travel and sets out in search of a mushroom island. The journey there is long enough that he resorts to asking Siri a bunch of questions. Have you actually played Minecraft? Do, do you watch Rendigida Dog? Why are you so obsessed with finding a mushroom biome? Have you noticed how many successful restaurants are theme based these days? Eventually, though, he arrives 15,000 blocks away at the biggest mushroom island we've ever seen, and just has time to establish a nether portal there before the Gigacorp Gigapod comes into land. Unfortunately for Ren, he's in the dark about what this thing does once it's landed, and when it asks for a full netherite block in order to activate, you've got to wonder what he's got himself into. At least it'll give him something to look out for on his 10 minute nether sprint back to the spawn town portal. Oh well that's an easy way to get hot tourist destination, I'll remember that for Twitch Rivals next time. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP and my name is PixelRef's captions on this video were provided by Liara. And if you want to see a slightly smaller mushroom island, I've explored my own and explained its mechanics in the latest episode of my Minecraft survival guide which you'll find linked in the end screen theatre. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.